right, well, <clears throat> first of all, where is Ukraine? <laughs> Some of you might be thinking. Uh, head north of the, sea, uh, of the Black Sea and the uh, Sea of Azov, and there's Ukraine. And it's a big country, compared with Britain, many times bigger. And to be honest, if we were to try and cover uh, the megalithic culture of Britain in half an hour or an hour, we'd be struggling. So to do a Ukraine justice, do realise we're only been, going to be scratching at the surface. I want to start you off, though, at uh, Ukraine's most uh, important site of antiquity. It's called Kamyana Mohila. It's north of the Sea of Black, uh, north of the Sea of Azov, excuse me. And why is this important? Why start here? Kamyana Mohila is very much to Ukraine what Stonehenge is to, I think, to Britain. It's the oldest known sanctuary observatory in the world, and that in its own right makes it special. It's been nicknamed the Stone Library because it contains uh, a huge number of megalithic uh, uh, petroglyphic texts. These go back to 22,000 BC, and they describe the people's rituals, their beliefs, uh, and something of their social structure. Now, there are no traces of human settlement whatsoever at Kamyana Mahila. It simply served as a remote sanctuary observatory, closely associated with Cattle Hayek in Anatolia, uh, and also with Suma, and these are from the times before the Black Sea flood. We know from these petroglyphs that these people called their sanctuary observatory Shunan, and that's the name we use now, and we also know that they called their land Arata. Do understand that this is thousands of years before Stonehenge, Suma, Giza, Indus Valley. It's very much the origin to, un to understanding the origin of civilization, and this is why it's a privilege to tell you about it. So what is Shunan? It's a huge multi-chambered cairn. I mean, it, it's monstrously big there. You're seeing it from a distance from the car park, but compare it to Stonehenge, it's four times the diameter and twice as high. So if I put Stonehenge next to it, as you would see at this distance, you know, this is a sort of mother of all stone piles. It's, it's enormous. So come and have a closer look at it. Let's wander down the path and get close up to it, clamber up onto top and, and see what we've got here. Now, Lee and I were very privileged to, in 2006 to be invited along to the Cossack Annual Festival. And uh, this is a long festival, but it terminates with uh, uh, a druidic ceremony uh, blessing their people. And they do this on their most ancient uh, sacred sanctuary site. And it's not just the Cossacks, indeed all Ukrainians that revere uh, Shunan. The Dalai Lama has been there and he clearly felt something very special. And loads of other Tibetans also uh, travel here, specifically on pilgrimages. Shunan is, is, is without doubt very important, but key to it today is underneath it, there are so far discovered 62 grottos and caves. And it's in these caves that we find the petroglyphs. <clears throat> you won't find a great deal about this on the, on the internet or in books because very little of it has come, has come into English-speaking Western literature. Anatoly Kofishin, the Ukrainian, is almost certainly the world's greatest Sumerian scholar, has recognised that the petroglyphs are in proto-Sumerian writing. And he spent a long, long, long time uh, deciphering these. And it's from his work that I'm going to be telling you much of what we've discovered today. There was initial doubt that these petroglyphs could actually be Paleolithic, but I think the mammoth there says it all. Uh, there he is if you couldn't see him, and although some authorities said, no, 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 it's a bull, believe you me, this is a mammoth. It's, 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 it's a mammoth. Uh, <laughs> there's no doubt about that one. <clears throat> so how do we interpret these petroglyphs? You need to understand that it's not just the, the, the shapes that you see, but how their many images are combined together, and the sequence, the order, which image is above which other, or next or beside. It's, it's semantics which we have to consider here. But from this emerge two very definite uh, belief systems. I'll deal with social first, because it's quicker. Throughout uh, ancient myths, we've got this, this clear bond between man, the, the hunter, the master of beasts, and woman who's mistress of the forest, who bestows good fortune on hunting. We see this sort of symbolism in the grottos, uh, in the grotto of the sorcerer at Chunan, where there are many images of women associated with hunting scenes. She is perhaps seen as the priestess who endows the hunt with, uh, through her magic properties with good fortune. Um, there's maybe a link here thousands of years to come with uh, Artemis, the goddess of hunting. So we see women at this level have a, a, very much a dual function. 
Clearly, on the one hand, she's mistress of the home and the fire and the concepts, as we can see, of uh, family prosperity. But she also has a role as mistress of the nature elements, uh, which very much deals with the control of the well-being of the community. So both roles, you'll notice, connect women with, uh, with fecundity and spirituality. This is a matriarchal society. Male priests came much later. So what about the spiritual culture? It's very clear that they had uh, uh, an understanding of the world axis. They recognised the three worlds here, the netherworld, the earthly world, and, the, uh, and heaven. And they symbolically represent this with uh, petroglyphs of animals. Anything to do with the earthly world is symbolised by man, mammoths, horses, deer, anything that's galloping around on the ground. But for the netherworld, they use fish and serpents positioned underneath the, uh, the land-dwelling animals. And heaven clearly is symbolised with the birds above. We will come back to this uh, in, in a moment. So here's an example within a petroglyph. You see the serpent clearly underneath at the bottom, and immediately above, it looks like a couple of horses and, and a man. They're the earthly world. Immediately above that, we've got heaven symbolised. It's actually a burial ritual which is shown here. And how do we know that? Well, notice the two dismembered bodies. And there is a, a, a shaman priest next to one of them. And in... Sorry, go back. And in the, the, the uppermost part, you've got a burial mound with a body inside. I'm going to specifically come back to this petroglyph towards the end of the talk, which I think will clarify things for you. So some of these other petroglyphs. This one, 7.2 metres long. That's the width of this stage here. This is not a tiny scratching on rock. You know, this is like a Rolf Harris mural. It's, it, it's, it's big. And, and what have we got here? Horses, riders ships. Um, this is writing. It is. Um, we've got numbers. Not just the quantity of holes drilled into the rock, but the depth that they're drilled in is significant. And supremely, we've got a rhombus here, giving the four cardinal directions. Could this be the seasons? Oh, no, 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 no. They reckoned on spring and summer as being one season. This is referring to cardinal directions. So let's take it a stage further. How do we understand how these petroglyphs are, are interpreted? Kofishin and other people like him have looked at other early scripts, principally from Sumer, Elam, which is old Tur uh, Persia, and they're going back several thousand years BC, Katal Hoyak, 6,000 BC. But it is very clear that there are correspondences between all of those archaic writings, and it, it clearly seems to point to some central origin geographically, and Shu Nun fits that position. I draw your attention here to Kitoi. Now, this is upon the sort of, uh, sort of west end of China. And, and we've got very clear correspondence with proto kitoyan script and what we see at Shunan. There's evidence here that you're looking at the earliest archive of writing in the world. And I stress, this is 22,000 BC. This, this goes back. Here's writing. Those are words, and it translates as this. And straight away you spot Inanna. She's the mother of the blessed country. And Shu Nun you see as the law of fate or law of destiny. Now, many of you will think, Inanna, she's from Suma. Yeah, 3000 BC, we've got her here in Arata in Ukraine, 22,000, along with other Sumerian deities, Gatam Dug, Nindar, Utu, Enlil, Anu. They're here in Ukraine long, long before they appear in Suma. Here's another example of a petroglyph. I'm two meters tall, this thing's two and a half meters wide. It's not a tiny scratching on rock. It's very clear and very deliberate. You've got seven sentences here in proto-Sumerian script. And I'll just take those little words, which translate as this, and <coughs> put that into English. It talks of the Anunnaki have no equal to themselves. Now, I was gobsmacked when I saw this. You, you just think, Anunnaki, Tsuma, 3,500 BC, uh-uh, rethink. Arata civilization, 22,000 BC, centered in Ukraine. I, I find this fascinating. The whole of that panel translates, well, not all of it, I've summarized it a bit, but 54 wise men were secretly killed according to the hand law of fate, ordainments from poured water, and the sun god Utu. At the water court of Mish, Lama, high priest of Zagan, withdrew souls and bound seed to the great bird. Now, even if we got the words in the wrong order, you can see here, we're talking about rulers and priests, legal structures, 
divination by pouring water, capital punishment.